gamers out there welcome to the players 2 podcast the video game podcast for gamers like you by gamers like you you can find players 2 on all the social media that's facebook twitter instagram youtube the lot you can also find our written content over at players 2.com that's p-l-a-y-e-r-s-t-o-o.com and if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on apple podcasts that would be greatly greatly appreciated it does a huge amount for the exposure of the podcast and a big thanks to anyone who's already done that, already followed us on social media or already given us a listen. We really appreciate it. And again, the numbers have just been far better than I anticipated. And we're still on news and noteworthy. Yeah. So, which is pretty awesome. So tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> All right, let's get this show on the road. My name is Mark Henderson, and with me as always, Mr. Lewis Gamley. How's it going, Lewis? It's going okay, Mark. I've had a day from hell at work, and <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad to be not in the office anymore and here talking to you about video games. Awesome. Well, what have you been playing this week? This week, um, I have been switching around between a few games. So the first thing to mention probably is um, Cuphead. I've been playing a lot of Cuphead recently. Me too, me too. Um, So we're both playing on the Switch. And if you don't know this, this is the game from Team MDHR, which is basically a kind of bullet hell game set in a sort of cartoon universe the most incredible hand-drawn graphics that you will ever see in a video game. Yeah, it looks like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible really cool. with so many different kind of different variations on boss fights that you go through as you play. And yeah, it's just tough as all hell to play through. <laughs> it's utterly unforgiving. And yeah, but so I, I'm just on World 2, roughly just shy of about halfway through the game. I think you're still a wee bit ahead of me, actually. Uh, yeah, but really not by very much. So I'm now on the dragon who's called Matchstick. Grim Matchstick, maybe? I think it's Grim Matchstick. <laughs> and he is absolutely solid. He is very, very difficult. I'm kind of struggling with him quite a bit, to be totally honest with you. He's been by far the most difficult one I've done so far. And a lot of them, a lot of them cause you quite a lot of problems. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he is, he is particularly, particularly bad. Yeah, you say that, you know, that most of them cause you a little bit of problems. There is not an easy level in this game, that should be said. No, there is um. not. Even, <laughs> even the quote unquote easy ones at the beginning because you're also just starting out, are also very difficult. (laughs) But yeah, it's been great fun getting further and further into that. So there's just one other game that I'd like to mention as well that I've been playing quite a bit of recently um, and kind of been playing on and off over the last like month or two. And that is Return of the Obra Dinn. Yes. If you don't know... This is another game with a stunning art style. It's just the most incredible art style. Um, It looks like an old kind of sort of mac os game from like the 80s yeah, or yeah, even really, earlier yeah. it's like one bit graphics or whatever it's basically black and then that kind of greeny color you yeah. used to get in like old desktop computers and actually what you can do within the game is change that you can have it look in all sorts of different ways but they're all kind of riffing on those styles like oh, really? old that's, computing that's styles cool. that's cool and so essentially the game um which you can get on steam it's not on any other platforms at the moment is just a it's a, a kind of puzzle game a detective game where you play as a I think he's an insurance inspector who enters this ghost ship, essentially, this ship that's come into port and all the crew are dead and there's loads of bodies strewn all over the place and your job is simply just to walk around and find out what happened. It's quite difficult though as well. It's incredibly difficult. There's no there's no prompts really in the game. All you get is like a manifesto of who was supposed to be on the ship and some drawings of the people who are supposed to be on the ship. Uh, that's kind of it yeah, and you're supposed to kind of match up what happened and it's kind of a lot of logic problems like if this happened and this happened then this couldn't have happened so this has to have happened and he killed him exactly kind of I mean, and you see like it, what you get is these kind of flashbacks to it's sort of as if your character can see what happened in real time you kind of get these big uh, startling flashbacks and some of those some of the jump cuts that the game uses to show you what has happened in the past are astonishing and not like anything oh, really? I was expecting in wow, the game that's really cool. I won't say anything to spoil it but there are moments where it kind of takes takes you back in time and you're confronted by a site that you did not <laughs> expect in the slightest to see in this game and so you work backwards from there and yet it's exactly as you said there Mark it's like you get a little snippet of dialogue and you'll go well that guy has an Irish voice and he's speaking to this character who I already know his name so he must be this rank and so I can kind of guess that he's this guy and the whole thing is like that and it's just absolutely staggering to play through that's pretty cool really enjoying that's it that's pretty cool it's been high on my list of kind of indie and games that I've wanted to play for quite a long time well since it came out basically mm-hmm. which was kind of the end of last year wasn't it? Uh, yeah October last year yeah yeah, it's it's been pretty high for me so I'll definitely get around to that at some point as well I've actually been going back into my indies backlog and started to play a couple of things as well one of which was Braid 
uh, the other one of which was Journey, which I know got a lot of accolades back in the day when it first came out, which is ages ago now. Um, 2012, in fact, is when it first came out on the PlayStation 3. Uh, but subsequently, it was re-released on the on the PS4, and yeah, it was it was a remarkable little game where it is, it is just a walking simulator, basically. I mean, that's yeah. all it is, and then you get powers to be able to jump, basically, and your your main power is jump. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was great. It was a really amazing experience that I had with it as well, where you kind of meet up with others who are playing the game, and even though this game is so old, I still met up with other people playing the game within the game who are just a wee character exactly like you, and then you just travel to the top of this mountain with each other and then right right i I suppose i probably shouldn't spoil it but there's like a really kind of powerful thing that really happens right at the end and i was like god that was brilliant (laughs) it was a really really short experience as well like i I think i finished it maybe what three years yeah something like that yeah it it was really really quick god it was good it was really really good and the other one that i played recently was unfinished swan which again is quite an old game uh, from the developers giant swan who also done what remains of Edith Finch, which is another game that I also played <laughs> relatively recently, but not quite as recently as these ones. They're they're a really great indie dev studio, actually. The Unfinished Swan has an incredible mechanic where initially you are just dropped into the game and it's just completely white and it gives you no prompts and nothing. So I was just pressing buttons and trying to move the joysticks and you can hear your steps moving around. And you're like, oh, what's what's going on here? What's, what's happening with this? And eventually I'm just hitting all the buttons and I'm just like, what does anything happen? And then one of them, one of the shoulder buttons eventually just throws a paintball and then that then splats and then ah. you can then see like the corner of a wall. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I need to paint my way around this level. <laughs> it, it was It's very strange and it's very kind of difficult to describe over like an audio medium like a podcast. But I mean, you can get it. I, I don't think it must not be very uh, expensive at all. It must be pretty damn cheap, I would have thought. And yeah, it was it was really worth the time. I thought it was it was a great little game. Nice honestly. one. Yeah, I need to get I need to get like a big RPG to get stuck into him. <laughs> uh, my, my game right now is Cuphead, and I can't I can't give too much time to that all at once because I just get endlessly frustrated. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not a game for moving through and kind of experiencing in different ways. But no. that's really, I'm I'm quite um, interested in Unfinished One now that you've discussed it. It seems to just be a, a PlayStation exclusive. It was actually published by Sony. Seems to be. Um, yeah, like that sounds really cool. Yeah, it was. It, it does seem to be. I didn't actually know that it was a, a PlayStation yeah. exclusive, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was on PS3 and then later re released on PS4. It was it was really good. I mean, if you can get it for like a fiver or something like that, it's, it's definitely worth the money. Definitely worth nice money. one. Definitely check it out. Yeah. Okay, on to the news then. Let's do it. Okay, uh, unfortunately, there's not a huge amount of news related to games, but there seems to be a kind of bit of industry news that's happening just now. Uh, and news item number one is that the EA executives and higher ups have given up their bonuses due to the performance in 2019 being a down year. <laughs> and yeah, correct. Yeah, being a performance that isn't <laughs> worth a bonus, basically. Yeah, a performance that is definitely not worth a bonus. And apparently this has went in to give bonuses to other paid staff. They kind of lower down paid or give them bigger bonuses. Bonuses they should probably get anyway. Mm, yeah. But nonetheless, quite a good thing, quite a good response to what was obviously a difficult year for EA off of the back of well, the microtransaction crap and then subsequently Anthem at the beginning of this year, which is performed well well under expectations i would say i think the only thing that they've done right is probably apex and even that's kind of fallen away now you know i mean falling away is a bit harsh maybe but yeah no, well it is i mean as opposed to being like one of the top three twitch games it's now kind of down in like 15 20 oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. God, i mean it's still a damn good game I, I still really like it but it's not it's not it's not got quite the legs that fortnite has yeah you know, it's, it, well it was not it was never really realistically not designed to, to be that. that way maybe but uh, yeah but it's it's kind of fallen down like to where PUBG and things like that are. There's, <laughs> a, there's, a, there's a lot of enormous games that have been less popular recently. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think you're right in that sense. Uh, obviously, FIFA, and I'm, I'm sure there are other sports hits would have been big yeah, financial Madden, success Madden's for them. Enormous as but well, in terms of North like, America. in terms of critical success, or in terms of kind of the way that players are talking about their games, yeah, it's been a real bad year for EA, and I mean, often EA are taking a beating anyway. But other than Apex, no real standouts. The real nah. disaster of Anthem. We do have the Jedi Fallen Order game to look forward to later in the year, and that might be what turns the yeah, I, I do fortunes hope that that around. Does turn their fortunes around the wee bit i mean everyone likes to dogpile on ea and they're always the the bad guys in almost every situation and and quite often there's been a justified yeah. response to be completely <laughs> honest but I, I mean i don't i never want to see anyone fail i never want to see any 
games go by the wayside you know and I've, like in particular a star wars game like i want to play a good star wars game that would that don't, would be great, don't we so. all good lord absolutely yeah it's what have they done nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> But yeah, what, so what's your kind of take on them giving that up? Is that just a way of saying to their own staff, like, we understand that things aren't going well, or is it a signal to us as players? I, I'm not, well, I, th- I think it was probably more internal, to be honest. I think that it was the right decision. I'm not sure that it wouldn't have been written into their contract somewhere that if they didn't perform, then they couldn't have taken it anyway. So in actual fact, they're not really giving it up. It was basically they just never they never got to they the didn't point where they take it yeah. in the first place <laughs> yeah so I don't really know what the situation for that was but either way there would have been money set aside to give these execs their enormous enormous bonuses and it's, it's good to hear that at least that money's going back into the system back into supporting devs and giving them a wee bit of extra cash yeah. maybe you know so and probably paying those Bioware uh, developers some crunch time to fix Anthem. <laughs> yeah, well, ho- hopefully not. Hopefully not crunch time. But yeah, maybe give them some extra money because they clearly either they never got enough <laughs> or they never got enough time. But that didn't go well at all. <laughs> all right. News item number two. EA again. EA again. And Epic defending microtransactions against a parliamentary committee here in the UK. Did you see this? I haven't watched the actual video, but I've read the whole, well, a huge chunk of the transcript. And My good God, Lord. Yeah. it was painful. It was them just deflecting questions and not really giving them very straight answers. And a parliamentary committee that knew absolutely, they didn't have a clue what they were fucking talking about. It was absolutely <laughs> embarrassing. It was a remarkable thing. Yeah, and I mean, parliamentary committees often don't really know what they're talking about, but this one seems to have been especially bad. Especially over their heads. Yeah, yes. um, it, it just seems to be that the, is- the issues up for discussion were things around microtransactions, loot boxes, gambling. Are those things gambling? What is the duty of care for developers and publishers towards their players? And it seems basically yeah. like the parliamentary EA committee... had the balls to come out and say that they're not loot boxes, they're surprise mechanics. And, and I'm just like, quite what fun. are you talking about? <laughs> and quite fun. Yeah, who's going, oh yeah, you know, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to go and buy another loot box. Like, that's just not a thing that happens, you know? No. Oh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It was, it was, it was really horrifying to watch. I can't remember how long the video was. It was... I mean, these like committees go on. Well, the, the full committee would have been... Oh, no, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that would have been much that, longer, yeah, yeah. but I think the the main section that I watched was like 20, 20 minutes, minutes or something yeah. like that. It's, it's kind of worth watching because it, it was like watching a car crash in slow motion. It was honestly one of the most awkward <laughs> things I've ever seen <laughs> A car crash, but where both cars are slowly driving into each other and could have moved, but just didn't know how to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah didn't know how to operate the steering wheel. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was a crazy thing. Just in the, the zeitgeist of video games, I'm kind of fed up hearing about microtransactions and mm-hmm. talking about microtransactions and just the chat around microtransactions and loot boxes in particular and man we just need to take a hard stance on this and just be like no this is this is bad yeah it doesn't matter if they're quote-unquote fair or whatever then just it just sets a bad precedent and yeah i just wish they would go away <laughs> quite frankly but uh, yeah unfortunately i don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon because they make people like epic and ea an absolutely colossal amount of money well that's it and if they're you know up for facing parliamentary committees and you know other governmental bodies and talking about these things and deflecting and dodging then they obviously have a real vested interest in keeping those things going and keeping them alive so they're definitely not going anywhere we've talked a little bit kind of off air about games regulation and that sort of thing yeah Um, i would see be honest with you i know that a lot of people would cringe at this but i think that this is where governmental regulation is a good thing do you know what i mean like as far as i'm concerned microtransactions sorry loot boxes are gambling it is the same game of chance you're playing with that as you're with the roll of a dice or the spin of a roulette wheel as Mm -hmm. far as i'm concerned yes you're always guaranteed to have a reward but if that reward is totally useless to you then i mean what worth does that really have to me nothing do you know what i mean and also there's a whole claim as well around that although buying a packet of Pokemon cards, say, is actually a very similar transaction. You still have something tangible in the real world yeah. there in that transaction, do you know what I mean? Although what you've bought is technically random, whereas this is just a, a, a piece of code, a bit of digital apparel that yeah. you've bought yourself that has no real world worth. And yeah, as, as far as I'm concerned, loot boxes are really, really harmful. They can, they can be better and worse, I think, 
uh, Overwatch has been the kind of bastion of how to do this kind of right and just have it yeah. purely cosmetic, no pay to win, nothing like that. And a lot of people since the Battlefront 2 backlash have kind of followed suit in that model, including Fortnite. But I really think that it is still gambling. It is still playing a game of chance with real money. And these games are for kids. Do you know what I mean? Like Fortnite is a a kids game. I mean, fair enough. EA can say, oh, well, people under the age of whatever shouldn't have been playing our games. But I can't can't remember what Battlefront 2 was, but it was probably like about 16 or something. I would have thought. I would think even less probably. Yeah, well, because it's Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think at all that they are a good thing and I think that regulation on these things and if you're going to put loot boxes in your games then your games have to be sold with an 18 sticker on them because I I have nothing against gambling like I gamble I I bet on football matches I occasionally very occasionally go to casinos and things like that I've got nothing against gambling in principle but I've got a problem with advertising it constantly to well children in particular or people that are underage who are using their parents money that is just a couple of clicks of a button yeah. and then they've got this new thing and that's not really acceptable, you know? Totally, yeah. And also just, you know, generally vulnerable people who have access to money even more easily than kids do. It's a dangerous thing. Some of the other things that the the EA and Epic in particular were saying in this meeting, though, you know, denying that they take information or, or I mean, not even denying, claiming that they don't gather information about the players that are playing their games they don't take demographic information it's, oh that's just nonsense it, i mean it's either I mean, see, be honest, it's either it, an untruth or it's completely baffling that they aren't doing yeah why things. yeah i'm almost yeah exactly i'm my question is well why aren't you doing yeah, that like it, everyone else in the world's doing and that you don't surely? you don't need specific you know like names and addresses and stuff but to know the age of a player seems like quite an important thing for a game developer and it's particularly it's marketing arm to know and understand trends and that kind of thing so it just doesn't help that the people asking them these questions were just woefully unprepared, completely oh, God, out honestly, of date, honestly. following like the dog whistle of tabloid journalism that basically had them. I mean, apparently they were saying things in this meeting, you know, comparing loot boxes and games to drug addiction and c- conflating the comments that um, Prince Harry recently made about Fortnite to you know, these much worse social issues that just, that there's no comparison at all. And so you've got one side who doesn't know what they're talking about, talking to people who absolutely know what they're talking about and are quite clever about what they're talking about. And it just leaves the, the players in the middle of this kind of mess. Okay, moving on to news item number three. This one being quite UK specific. Game, the high street retailer for all things video games, has been bought by Mike Ashley's Sports Direct. I hope if you live in the UK, you're aware of Mike Ashley, but for th- those who don't, Lewis, how would you describe <laughs> Mike Ashley? A crook. A crook. A crook. <laughs> a he's, business crook. He's not a very good man, is he? He doesn't have a very good reputation. Yeah, he's not least of which because at the places that he owns, these Sports Direct stores, what does he, else does he own now? He owns Fraser's here. He owns Fraser, yeah, he just recently bought the House of Fraser department store chain. He owns Newcastle United Football Club. Yeah, and basically puts as little money into all <laughs> these businesses as physically possible, has been known to treat his staff like absolute shit and quite illegally, frankly. Yeah, pay less than the minimum wage. Pay less than the minimum wage, not give them appropriate breaks, not letting them go to the toilet and things like that with within his stores. And this is the kind of culture that are in things that he owns. And it's it's not a nice thing to hear. It sounds as if Graham Game was in a lot of financial problems, so therefore maybe this was the only option. Maybe it was this or they, they were going to close down entirely, yeah. which that, that would have been really sad. We've spent a lot of time buying things from games over the years yeah uh, more recently they started turning their eye towards esports and having a lot of kind of esports type setups within a lot of their stores which i mean th- think about that what you will it didn't particularly interest me but they they obviously had to do something to try and keep themselves afloat and it seems as if this offer of mike ashley is the only thing that is really possible for them now it was either this or the doors start closing. Well, yeah, and, and the Sports Direct group had already been kind of aggressively buying up shares over the last few years, so I think they really were sort of left in a position of not being able to refuse it. Like you say, it's a real shame. I think they said they begrudgingly accepted it. Yeah, that. basically. And they, and they had like to, they actively said that. Yeah, and they have to sort of instruct their stakeholders that this is the thing that we've got to do. But yeah, it does, it's not good news for anyone involved, really, other than Mike Ashley, I suppose. Mm. Um, and it's, whether or not it's the case in elsewhere in the world, but certainly high streets in this country are in terminal collapse and it's all yeah. coming down. We just in Glasgow recently lost a really good independent game shop called GeForce, yep. Um, yep. which was fantastic yep, for, a lot of stuff for grabbing games. 
games, they yeah. regularly broke embargoes, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did regularly break embargoes. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's a it's just a sad state of affairs to see the kind of physical retail market go down really even before the digital one has fully fully kind of taken over so yeah i mean unfortunately i think this is the way that we're going and even game more losing money to cex mm -hmm. and on trade-ins and yep. things like that because often cex were giving you better prices than game War. yeah and it just felt as if they were they were just getting pushed on every single side and supermarkets and, as well oh yeah supermarkets lunch, as well yeah. selling games cheaper yeah. than specialist stores I think they were trying to rely on having oh well the exclusives and things like that yeah uh, steel books and stuff steel books all that yeah but yeah it's it's just a, it's just a very just a very sad state yeah and the, and the, and other than kind of job losses and stuff as well the real shame is that the expertise that you have in brick and mortar video game shops versus supermarkets in particular that's all going to be lost and that stuff not so much for me and you and maybe some of our listeners who are quite well versed in the video game world but for those parents who are struggling with what the hell a microtransaction in a loot box and stuff is that's a place that they can kind of go and get recommendations and get information and it's yeah it's just a shame that we're going to be losing out on that yeah that is it's a real shame Okay, and just on to some additional shout-outs uh, for some games that came out this week, starting with Crash Team Racing. This is the, the nitro Fueled remake, which again has holds a very special place for me and Lois. We played a huge amount of the original back in the day. Uh, it seems to be doing pretty well on the old Metacritic. I know Metacritic isn't the be-all and end-all, <laughs> but it, it gives a relatively good indication. It's sitting on there at an, an 84. Definitely worth buying. I was watching some Let's Plays of it over the last week, and yeah, it looks, it looks really good fun. It looks like a really good remake. I think some of the load time particularly on switch aren't brilliant just now but hopefully that's just a matter of optimization and can maybe be patched out the next one i just wanted to mention was judgment this was from sega it's actually a playstation exclusive but it's from the yakuza team yeah at sega uh it's kind of tangentially related to the yakuza series so far as i can make out um i was never a big fan of the yakuza series i don't think you were either particularly Lewis. but it looks like quite an interesting game if you are interested in the yakuza series it may be worth checking out for you the Metacritic score for that is currently at 80. Then one of the indies, which is definitely catching a lot of traction just now, is My Friend Pedro, which is an absolutely wild looking game where it looks like kind of, what was it, Gun Fu? That's what, that's yeah, what they call it. Yeah. It's like a Gun Fu side scrolling platformer, and it, it looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's a digital devolver game, and if you know those guys from E3, they are absolutely nuts. <laughs> it, it looks really fun. This I'm, it does. It looks really I'm really fun. Quite excited to give it a shot. It seems to just be like a sort of make your own action movie style game, and completely mindless. And sometimes that's particularly when you've been playing Cuphead all day. That's particularly yeah. what you need. To. No, it, is, it, it does look a bit. I think it looked pretty difficult. By the way, oh, I'm sure it will the be, streams yeah, that yeah. I was watching again, I had a wee look at some Let's Plays. Lewis has just, just thrown his phone about the place. The That's definitely <laughs> going to get picked up in the microphones. <laughs> Fully professional here at Players Day, so yeah. Um, and just the last one I wanted to mention is the Harry Potter Wizards Unite game. This is the new game from Niantic of Pokemon Go fame. And they've made a Harry Potter style Pokemon, Pokemon Go. Uh, by all accounts, it seems to be doing all right. It seems to be doing fine. It's generated $300,000 in revenue within its first day, which is not bad at all, although quite a ways off Pokemon Go, which had $2 million wow. gross in its first day. It was never going to do that. No. Pokemon Go was such a cultural moment. It was, a so, it was, so, it was a, such a phenomenon at that time. Yeah, it was, it was never going to do that, but 300000 in a day is not bad. I don't think many people are crying about that, you know? No. I've not given it a go yet, but I have downloaded it. Oh, have you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe give it a wee bash just to check it out. Of course, free to play. Hopefully the microtransactions in there aren't too egregious. They, they weren't in Pokemon Go, to be fair. No. It was, they, they were there. They were helpful if you did choose to spend some money on it, but they, they weren't overly, overly awful. Has there ever been a good Harry Potter video game? Has there ever been a good Harry Potter video game? I can't remember. Like, back in the PS1, there was... I remember playing... There was movie tie-ins for most yeah, of Yeah, there games. was movie tie-ins. I remember playing the first one, the Philosopher's Stone. But it was so long ago, I can't remember if that was just garbage. I think or I have a feeling they were all garbage. <laughs> maybe. As, well, there was a leak that there was going to be a Harry Potter RPG coming at some point, maybe next gen. So, hopefully. Maybe, hopefully maybe hopefully, by hopefully at that point, we'll yeah. have a good one. Okay, time for a little break, and we'll come back for Topic of the Week. And we are back for Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is a bit of a look at Google Stadia and Microsoft xCloud in particular, but just more the future of gaming altogether. <laughs> just our, our streaming future that we are inevitably marching towards this. How do you feel about it? 
<laughs> oh, I have lots of different feelings. I should say I was very skeptical about uh, streaming generally and this kind of notion of what our future as gamers is going to look like. But some of that scepticism has been a little bit cleared up by what we learned at E3 about both Stadia and xCloud in particular, the kind of noises we've been hearing about this partnership between Sony and Microsoft towards cloud streaming. And yeah, I, I'm a little less concerned about it. My biggest issues basically are one sort of what is the point for most gamers um, and is that going to destabilize the kind of console market and take away exclusives and the kind of uh, the push that big console sales can give to certain games and also just the kind of traditional issues around latency and around input lag and all that kind of stuff that I think will make it not a particularly enjoyable experience for a lot of gamers while we still have quite limited internet access. I know you're a bit more of an evangelist for this kind of thing. I'm not not this specifically. I'm not Ugh, right, okay, how do I phrase this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an evangelist for this. I don't even necessarily think that I'm going to take part in game streaming very much because I'll just buy the next PlayStation or Xbox or Switch or whatever when it comes out. But I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily the, the capabilities of being able to play your AAA game on your phone from miles away from your console. It's more to me an accompaniment to a traditional console or a traditional gaming experience or like a PC or whatever it is that you choose to game on. It's more an accompaniment to these things. However, the way that Google's price plan just now seems to be being interpreted is that if you wanted to play, say, Assassin's Creed, on your PlayStation, then you can play, play, play away. And then assuming that PlayStation are okay with crossplay on that, then you could then play it on Google Stadia as well, which means that you could then play it on your phone or you could then play it on a tablet or you could then play it on your laptop, wherever. However, it does seem to be suggesting currently that on the base plan, at the very least, you will have to also buy the game on Stadia, which means that you're buying effectively two copies of the game at that point, which is a bit nightmarish if they're still going to be full price, yeah. uh, like a f- full price, like a physical copy on Stadia. So I do worry about a lot of this. I do worry about what it means for multiple subscriptions because we now know from E3 that the new Ubisoft streaming service, which is what was it called, like Uplay Plus or I think something so, like yeah, that, yeah. is going to be available on Stadia. But that in itself is an additional, say, tenner a month. And then you're already paying for Stadia. And then if this does end up snowball, and then when you end up paying for Stadia, then you have to pay for Uplay, then you have to play for EA Play, then you have to play for Battle.net. And it's just like, where does it stop? That that does worry me quite a lot. And then you could end up paying, I don't know, say 40, 50 quid a month to play all these games. And if you spend more than that on games just now, then I don't know, maybe okay, but... Probably not. Probably that's looking like a pretty bleak future. Yeah, and you're still going to resent having to buy copies of things multiple times if that's how it works. Well, yeah, if that is how it works. Well, I don't know. If you buy it through Uplay, like say you bought Assassin's Creed yeah. through Uplay, then will they also let you play it on PlayStation? Will PlayStation let you play it well, on PlayStation? Those are the big questions. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, it's, it's all still very, very murky, mm-hmm. I think, is something to be said just now. And I know a lot of people are just kind of writing off. And I think that that's... I think that that's a stupid thing to do mm-hmm. because I really think that ultimately this is where all these people want to be. This is where Google wants to be. This is where PlayStation wants to be. This is where Microsoft wants to be because it means that they don't have to sell physical hardware at a loss in the hopes that they make it up on software, which is what all the consoles do. Like that's it's what PlayStation have done, which is what Microsoft have done. I'm sure it's what Nintendo do as well. They, they sell these consoles at a loss knowing that they're going to make it back on the software side yeah. but they don't want to do that there's no way that they want to do that so if they can just take it all away and then you just launch your playstation app on whatever device you decide you want to play on and then you play that way through a subscription that's it's not going to be looking great and it seems as though the only two that are really capable of doing it just now are google just by pure might and willpower and Microsoft just now who have their Azure system already set up for this sort of thing and I'm not calling it Azure despite the fact that they want us to call it Azure the colour is Azure <laughs> and I don't understand why people seem to have a problem pronouncing this it's crazy Xbox naming uh, oh, things yeah, just yeah, it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what has changed for me is that before E3 and before we got some of the detail about particularly about Stadia it seemed to me that streaming was all about 
you, you know, this kind of fantasy vision of it's going to be the Netflix of games and you'll be able to play anything you want and everything will be on there. And also it'll be sort of limitless access and you'll be able to play, you know, cross play will just happen naturally. And all these kind of big promises were being made. And it seemed to me like what that will effectively do is kill a lot of the the console market and by extension the kind of exclusives market it well if it takes off playstation if it, basically if it takes off and gains traction in that way then yeah it could and i think that what i was saying is that i feared for playstation mm-hmm. in that future however they've just now come out with some partnership with xbox to use their microsoft azure systems mm-hmm. for streaming in the future hopefully I th- that was that was sony and microsoft at a much higher level than their game gaming divisions, gaming yeah. divisions but but yeah it means that they will ultimately have access to that yeah and so it seems just now though that the way that both systems are looking it's a mu- like you said there it's much more of an accompaniment and i think that that might change over the years as streaming becomes something that more gamers are used to but right now this notion that we're all going to chuck our boxes away and we'll just kind of join the cloud i think that's far off and i think most people most gamers for the next two three four years certainly kind of most of the next ge- uh, console generation so to speak if we even have those will be playing on traditional boxes but may well dabble they might well have a stadia account and they might play the odd game on there they might try different things in different places but i think gaming isn't about to radically change in the way that certainly i was kind of a bit concerned that it would because we- i know i don't think it's going to change this generation certainly i think that this might be something that we're very much looking at next generation oh sorry the, the generation after so maybe six years from now then maybe streaming a game is going to be a lot more commonplace than just buying it mm-hmm. well, another thing that i think is very important to this is 5g which i know that we've discussed off air before and how important that's eventually going to be when it gets rolled out and how the, the speeds with which you can wirelessly transfer information will be massively, massively, massively increased to, to the point where it's kind of almost difficult to imagine how quick it will be. It can basically do away with wires if it is what it's promised to be. Yeah. It's like, because it's like a, a hundred gigabytes a second or something like that. Is Jeez. Yeah, so it's crazy. It's crazy stuff. I, d- I don't know if that's quite right. If I got that wrong, please feel free not to contact us on any social <laughs> media about it. Um, but I, I, ge- I do genuinely think that's going to be a big thing. Like uh, most phones and tablets and things like that will be on it. You'll be able to get it on your laptop and it means that you will always have a, a very fast connection. Or well, you should have a very fast connection hopefully no matter where you are of course this brings us on to another thing is that how many people now specifically when these things are launching when xcloud is launching when stadia is launching are going to have good enough internet to get the best kind of performance out of it i mean close to no one it feels like at the moment some of these systems are dropping i mean they're, well they're all dropping by the end of this year basically right at, at least in well i think well, sta- stadia, and, stadia definitely is yeah. and some for like xcloud will be playable in some way this year as well i'm yeah. not really sure if it's a full rollout or not no i think it, it definitely will be playable this year yeah, xbox i think it's kind of just beta testing and stuff to begin with but yeah at that point most people's internet is not going to i mean i'm sure a lot of people have an internet that's good enough to be streaming games to a certain extent but to overcome some some of the bigger challenges of the system it's just not there for most people and that's in this country and we know that actually our internet infrastructure is a bit better certainly in our major cities than it is in other parts of the world even in america but as well, that, yeah, I think unless you're in a big city in America, then you're pretty scum. You've got no chance. Yeah, yeah. And, and think about anyone here who lives in rural communities which struggle to get even mobile signal at the moment. Yeah, you know? well, that, well, again, particularly in Scotland, there's yeah. a lot of areas that are very, very rural. Yeah. So th- this will be totally useless to them. But just to, just to give you an idea of what Stadia are, are promised, and I think we went over this during our E3 podcast as well, but at 10 megabits per second, you should be able to get 720p, 60 frames per second, and set stereo sound at 20 megabits per second you should be able to get 1080p hdr video 60 frames per second and 5.1 surround which i think is what most people would be deem good enough and then if you want 4k hdr video 60 frames per second and the 5.1 surround then you're looking at 30 to 35 megabits it seems to be and I'm not sure how many people... I mean, I barely get that. I mean, I pay for quite expensive internet, but our internet here isn't all that good, really. I mean, not not in comparison to the kind of megabit internet that you hear people going on about in 
like San Francisco and the amazing internet speeds that you can get in a lot of Asian countries and uh, Korea and Japan in particular, like we're not even close to that. So I pay like quite a lot for my internet and I can barely get the 4K. Wow. And I don't think a lot of people are going to do that. I mean, I would be willing to bet that your internet probably isn't that good. Uh, nowhere near. Yeah, I have no idea what my speed is. It's not something I pay attention to much, but it's not. that's basically because it's not something I value very highly. As long as, to me, my internet can play movies at a normal kind of uh, fidelity on Netflix and can handle whatever I need on my laptop, that's fine. And so that's the other added expense of all of this that we haven't, you know, we're talking about the kind of sign-on rates and the subscription costs. But actually for people, it's going to also probably mean buying more, better internet. Yeah, exactly. Paying their ISPs even more. Well, this is the other thing as well, talking about ISPs, a lot of ISPs, not necessarily in this country very much, but in other countries have data caps as well. I know that that's a big thing in America particularly. And if you stream a video game, I've got a wee statistic here, I'm not entirely sure how this has worked out and I'm not entirely sure where I got it. So if it's bollocks, please don't. (laughs) <laughs> please don't blame me too much but apparently if you stream something like 65 hours of gameplay in 4k that is a terabyte of data which is a colossal amount of data considering a lot of these i, I don't really know how, how much these packages allow you to have in mm. other countries but i know that there are data limits on in loads of countries and loads yeah. of countries around the world and what kind of impact does any of this have on gaming that kind of as we know it just now thinking about things like the growth of VR gaming in the last few years and surely that's only going to get bigger can do we have any notion of whether one these things will be supported or two if they'll have even kind of worse sort of drag issues yeah, that, that's interesting I'm, I'm not really sure to be honest I've not heard a lot about no. VR and these situations I don't even know what VR Stadia or I mean presumably well they need uh, to X Cloud will uh, presumably X Cloud will support the Vive yeah. I would have thought yeah. but I d- I don't know if Stadia supports anything I would have thought that it would have been maybe the Oculus the Oculus Quest seems to be the new yeah hot one on the block yeah <laughs> uh, whereas the PSVR is still the most affordable one on the block and probably yeah. and definitely the one that sold the most is that right but yeah. I think that, oh yeah yeah as far as VR headsets I think the PSVR one is like head and shoulders but it's it's also the worst experience yeah, of them all exactly, because, yeah. but it's also the most affordable experience yeah. but it's the point that I'm going to kind of make just now like for VR and for a lot of people in VR it's good enough so when do we think that this is mm. going to be good enough when is it going to be good enough to play is it going to be great to play mortal Kombat online where input lag <laughs> is so unbelievably important that you basically can't even play on a wi-fi connection you need to be hardwired yeah. if you're being super super competitive about it when you're getting down to that granularity it's never going to be as good on stadia but is roaming around an assassin's creed going to be basically good enough yeah and acceptable enough and good enough that many people are willing to pay for it like i don't think personally i don't think that we are that far off at being good enough hard to say right now until we kind of can see it and get hands on with it but i think i agree i I would imagine within sort of two or three years certainly within this cycle of this kind of streaming future that we're talking about we're going to start to see some games at least be deemed that way. I would love it if we got to a position where, you know, a lot of the stuff that say on Steam just now, a lot of those smaller double A games or indie games that, you know, you might want to just dabble with, but you don't necessarily think are worth all of the money or you're not sure if it's worth their kind of risk of the money. If we got something more like a subscription service to them. So just imagine, for example, a Steam app on Stadia, where you paid a certain amount and you had access to a certain amount of games, or some competitor do, it does something similar to that. Stadia could support those games, double A or indie games, easily and would be, as you say, good enough. And you could try all sorts of different stuff that you would never play before. I think we're quite a ways away from not just fighting games, but from first person shooters being okay on that. Oh, way. yeah, yeah. I was just using Mortal Kombat as yeah. an example, but really any online multiplayer, yeah. the, the reaction time is important. Stadia is never going to be the primary place to play. Yeah, basically. So we're we're being quite negative here, maybe about some of the aspects of this. Tell me what it is about it that kind of interests you, at least. Being able to game anywhere, anytime, whenever I want, basically, is what I think is going to be the best part of it. You see all these images coming out of E3 of the Xbox controller with just like a phone mm. screen on it, and I just think that would be so fucking cool if it worked. If it worked is the yeah. crucial thing. If the latency is acceptable, if it's good enough. I think that would be amazing. Like, do you not think that would be amazing? I understand that there are negative connotations around that, but just in taking that as a singularity, like, would it be amazing if I could game anywhere, wherever I want, and play whatever I want on my phone with a controller or just using the screen? Like, 
as as a just a statement with none of the other baggage around it that would be fucking amazing yeah that that is an incredible promise and it's not something necessarily that i would do very often but yeah that there's so many say you wouldn't just play a wee quick uh, level of over or something like that what? on your phone on the <laughs> maybe i would on the train I, no? well i guess there's two things to that though i mean one i already have a switch for that's my go anywhere play and you know almost anything machine mm. but also um things like that i mean you mentioned the train there and that is when i would do a lot of my kind of gaming in that way you're totally reliant on public wi-fi then and that's almost certainly not going to be good enough unless these devices can you know hook up to mobile signals I yeah, well, like that's, that's going to be a thing, isn't it? Because yeah. right now your Switch can't, your Switch only does Wi-Fi. It yeah. has no capability of doing anything else. I don't really know what happens with the Switch when, yeah. when 5G eventually comes along, although I'm sure we'll have a pro model by then and it'll be yeah, all it'll, singing, all yeah, dancing. Definitely. But, you know, even for these new devices, you know, this idea of having your Xbox controller with a screen on top, if that can't natively connect to a mobile signal, like a 5G or a 4G signal or whatever, then it's kind of useless in, in some spaces. Well, your phone will be able to do it, that's the point. And then, oh, and, yeah. and then, your, and yeah. then your controller will be Bluetooth, Bluetooth to, to your phone. phone, I suppose so, yeah. yeah. Which I think I think actually cuts down on latency as well. I, I don't really know that for certain, mm. but... Well, well, actually, I haven't said that. Well, Stadia seem to be claiming that the fact that you can hook your phone up to the Wi-Fi and not to your TV or something mm-hmm. like that actually speeds up latency for them. So that's why they're trying to punt the controller quite hard because oh, they think okay. it's going to be the best experience because it's going to be less latency than if you were just playing on a screen or like Bluetooth and a controller to your a PC yeah. rather than using their controller, which directly Bluetooth not doesn't Bluetooth to the PC yet is connected via Wi-Fi. Yeah. To, and to they the see me thinking that that's going to cut down on latency. So maybe it will. Maybe it will. I mean, there's a, a this is the problem. <laughs> it's very, very murky. We, yeah. we basically don't know. I don't think everyone that's just saying, oh, this is going to be nothing. Google aren't going to do anything. Oh, they abandon projects all the time. Blah, blah, blah. All, all, all this narrative. I think that that's a bit of a foolish stance to take. I wouldn't die on that hell if I were you because yeah. whether it's Google or whether it's Microsoft, and I do think overall it probably is more likely to be Microsoft. Like this is the way that it's going. This is the way they all want it to go. The executives at that level mm-hmm. want it to go towards a streaming model because it will save them a colossal amount of money. Yeah, I suppose the, the only counterpoint to that is it is just is this what the gamers want? And we'll start to see that unwind over time. I think you're totally right that you're that that kind of vision of it in its kind of purest and most ideological form for gamers. Can I play whatever I want, wherever I want, for however long I want, and it will feel the same or it will feel good enough, at least in the short term. That, I think most people would be completely up for it. I still think in the short term, most people are going to play in different ways. Streaming might be more, a bit like VR actually, a bit more of a kind of luxury thing, something that some gamers want to try out, something that a lot of gamers will get really into for sure. But And that's why I would worry about Google's long-term investment because I think if five years from now it's not doing the numbers that they want or it's, you know they're having to spend huge... They'll just pull the plug on it. Yeah, if they're having to spend huge sums marketing it and stuff, I think that they might just pull it. But where I think it might get interesting at that point is if... If xCloud is the winner in that sense, you know, quote unquote winner, and if PlayStation and Sony are drawing on that same service, essentially, which seems to be the the basis of this new partnership um, between Sony and Microsoft, are we just back to the same console war that we've been in? Is it just PlayStation versus Xbox and does not PlayStation win in that case? Does not PlayStation One? No, Xbox One's either way. It seems because they would. Well, because Microsoft they, does. Yeah. Mic- yeah, well, Microsoft does because they would be paying. Well, Sony would be paying Microsoft for the service, regardless of how many consoles they sell. So, yeah. uh, and if Xbox were smart about it, it would be saying, "Well, if you have this amount of players on it, then you get this. They cost this amount of money, and if you have even more players, then it costs this amount of money." Yeah. I, I don't know how these deals are all worked out. That's pure speculation yeah. on my part, obviously. But at the absolute least, it should surely be if you're taking our streaming services then we get to put our xbox app on all playstations Ooh, Ooh. well like Mr. nintendo like over here just does something completely different no, well, they, <laughs> nintendo march to the beat of their own drum don't they they're they're doing wild crazy stuff so we'll yeah. just leave them be i quite i love them for that though. i love them for that long may it continue yeah it's, it's a good point that you brought up as well the fact that if google just pulled the blog on stadia then you don't own anything like it's all mm. just gone which i think is another very important conversation that we have to have with ourselves just now more uh, digital sales and things like game struggling here and i know that uh, gamestop in america is like on its last legs yeah. as well these 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 physical co- like i think there's a whole other conversation about that but that is a conversation for another day ladies and gentlemen i think we'll call it a day there so thank you very much for listening Please go and follow us on all the social media. That's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. 
YouTube, all that good stuff. Please take five seconds to give us five stars on Apple Podcast. It really does make a huge, huge difference. And it really does take you, honestly, no time at all. Hashtag five seconds, five stars. We're going to make it a thing. We're going to make it a thing, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. Next week, we will have an interesting podcast for you, which is maybe a wee bit different from what we've done so far. We'll kind of see how that pans out at the time. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. We'll be back next week. And yeah, have a good one, guys. Thanks very much.